Welcome to We're Reading Virtual Storytime Special Black History Month Stories for February 12th, 2021. Box Henry Brown Mails Himself to Freedom by Carol Boston Weatherford, illustrated by Michelle Wood. Geometry How many sides to a box? I was born about 45 miles from the city of Richmond in Louisa County in the year 1815. I entered the world a slave in the midst of a country whose most honored writings declare that all men have a right to liberty. I was a slave because my countrymen had made it lawful and utter contempt of the declared will of heaven for the strong to lay hold of the weak and to buy and sell them as marketable goods. From Narrative of the Life of Henry Box Brown, written himself, 1851. Wind. An autumn breeze blows maple leaves while I sit on my mother's lap. Slavery is a cruel wind, she says. Sweeping children away from parents, scattering families far and wide, she shivers and holds me close. Work. Like my seven sisters and brothers, I am put to work as a child first serving my master and mistress, then learning plantation chores in the hot sun. Every few months, I trudge 20 miles with my brother carrying grain to the mill. Brutality. Treks to market take my brother and me past plantations where we encounter other blacks, some shoeless, coatless, nearly skin and bone in burlap shirts and threadbare pants. We share our bread and meat with them. In the slave quarter, they recount the savage beating that many of them got for having been baptized just the night before. Split. I am 15 when my master dies and wills my family to his four sons. My parents, brothers, sisters, and I flung apart as if dandelion puffs. I land in the young master's Richmond tobacco factory. He warns the overseer to never whip me. Richmond. A sea of red brick rises from the James River. Slavery the cornerstone of it all. See the slave pens, whipping posts, auction houses, storefronts, tobacco factories, and grist mills, all busy. Folks in packets and boats with cargo, float along canals, people everywhere. Nat. After three visions, enslaved preacher Nat Turner sees an eclipse as a sign. He leads an army of 40 plus slaves to kill 55 whites. Whites call them monsters and hang them, knife them, or shoot scores of slaves. Others are whipped, put in irons, or half hanged and pelted with eggs. Lawmakers pass stricter black codes but rule out ending slavery. Nat Turner is tried, hanged, and skinned, but not before confessing. Fear. David Walker's appeal called for slaves to rise up. Nat Turner answered that call with a rebellion. A massacre, whites called it, so scared that they raised the militia. But slaves face fear every day, fear of the lash, of being sent further south, fear of fear of our families, being sold off, fear of never ever being free. Laws. Blacks may not carry canes, but must carry free papers or a slave pass. Freed slaves must leave Virginia within a year or return to bondage. No more than five blacks may gather except in church. Groups of blacks may worship only with a white preacher present. It is unlawful to teach blacks to read and write. Unwritten rule, as long as there is slavery, no blacks are safe. Overseers. When our black overseer dies, he is replaced by Stephen Bennett whose peg leg won't let him sneak up to eavesdropping on the sleeves. He gives a hundred lashes for coming a few cents or pounds short on a task. The next overseer, John F. Allen, is fiendish. When a slave who often sang takes sick, Allen has him dragged to the factory for two hundred lashes. The whipping doesn't cease until the ailing man faints. Crop In March, sow tobacco seeds in plant beds, fertilize with fish meal. Late spring, 
transplant to the field, plow row by row. When the plants bloom, break off the tops, pull suckers from foliage so leaves will grow. Late summer, split stalks three quarters of the way down, cut plants above the ground. Curing. One night in 1839, Stephen, an enslaved blacksmith on the Slade Plantation in Caswell County, North Carolina, fell asleep. In the log barn, he let wood fires beneath the tobacco die. He used charcoal to relate the fires. The tobacco leaves turned golden. Thus, bright leaf and flu curing were born. Stephen's master profited from the tobacco and the discovery. Processing. The bright leaf arrives by the barrel, by the cartload. Stri- strip stems from the tobacco. Flavor leaves and cauldron of licorice and sugar. Press into lumps and twist by hand. In the machine house, pack into boxes and casks. Lay the sweat house for 30 days, then sell. Nancy. At work, days drag on like a long winter, till I meet Nancy, an enslaved washerwoman, whose laughter is the sweetest music I know. To marry her, I need permission from her master. He grants it, promises never ever to sell her. Split us up. Me and my Nancy jump the room. Family. Barely a year later, Nancy's master goes back on his word. She and my children change hands like the seasons. Each master worse than the last. The last one, Mr. Cottrell, agrees to keep my family if I feed them, house them, and pay him. Small price, I figure. At First African Baptist Church, I join the choir. Thank God for keeping my family and faith intact. Worth. Nancy had been sold to Joseph Colquitt, a cruel saddler with an even meaner wife. Mrs. Colquitt carped that Nancy's breastfeeding and refined manners did not benefit one enslaved, so her husband sold Nancy for $450. Four months later, Mrs. Colquitt realized Nancy's worth and begged her husband to buy her back. He did, for $500. Deal. A second saddler, Mr. Cottrell, told me that my wife's master, Mr. Colquitt, aimed to sell her. Mr. Cottrell would step in and buy her if I would chip in $50 of the $650 asking price for Nancy and my children. He promised that if I did, he would prevent her from being sold off. To me, that seemed like a good bargain. Anchored. The good Lord anchored me and Nancy in the word and has given us three children. And then, blessed news, another babe on its way in a matter of months. Our family tree, my treasure, bears precious fruit. Our harvest of bountiful yields a bitter truth. We have less power to stay than weeds with shallow roots. Trade. Whites and blacks, enslaved and free, haggle in the marketplace. Peddlers hawking eggs, chickens, potatoes, peas, and corn sticks. Free blacks are barbers, blacksmiths, shoemakers, and shopkeepers, seamstresses, and domestics. They are allowed to buy land and own buildings. If I had their money, I would buy my family. Railroad. Richmond is not just a port city, but also a railway hub. Three lines converge, the Louisa Railroad, the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad, and the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. I see the trains and imagine boarding one, bound north past the Mason-Dixon line toward freedom. More. Nancy's master orders her to wash his clothes and me to stuff his pockets with silver. I tell him, none is due and I have none to spare. You will pay, he threatens, slamming a door. As Nancy sobs, I hug her tight. Our children flock around us, bracing against farewell. Snatched. That very day, Nancy's master snatches my family and pens them up for sale. Robbed of all that matters, I beg my master's help but he gives me not one cent of my hard-earned wages that he's pocketed. He says, I dare not meddle. Hell, there's a reason that the slave jail at Shoko Bottom is known as Devil's Half Acre. Upstairs, the tavern and boarding house run by the bully trader Robert Lumpkin, 
who lives there with a slave wife, Mary. Downstairs, a holding pen and a whipping room for breaking slaves. I cannot bear the thought of my family locked inside. Tokens. I buy some tokens to take to my loved ones in jail. Small sacrifice for one last embrace. On my way, a young man warns that I might be jailed myself for lies that my master told the jailer. The youth makes delivery in my stead, but mistaken for me, he is thrown in jail until my family's testimony set him free. The vexed jailer kicks the youth all the way into the street. Heaven. For one last glimpse of my loved ones, I watch the slave chain pass, bound for North Carolina. Father, father, my child yells from a wagon. I see my wife grab her hand and walk four miles with her. We shall meet in heaven, I whisper. Then she is gone. Lord, what more do I have to lose? Friends, when I needed a free man to enter a contract for me so that I could rent a house for my family, James Caesar Anthony Smith signed his name. When I needed money to pay Mr. Cottrell's debt and collect my household goods before auction, Dr. Smith had the remedy, $17. Church. Leaning on God, I sing at church with my friend, Dr. Smith. After several hymns, he kneels and sobs. The sin of human bondage suddenly clear to him. He vows never to worship at another church that twists the Bible to uphold slavery. I, too, need to take a strong stance. UGRR I have heard whispers of a way that is neither underground nor a railroad, yet it goes by that name, though only in hushed tones. Secret routes, safe houses, songs of stealing away. In those songs I hear a yearning, the same longing in my soul. Plan From that day on I ponder escape, But how, with only $166 to my name? While I'm at work, prayer shows me the way. I pay a carpenter to build a wooden box, two feet deep and three feet wide and two and a half feet long. I drill holes in the box for air. Courage. What have I to fear? My master broke every promise to me. I lost my beloved wife and our dear children, all sold south. Neither my time nor my body is mine. The breath of life is all I have to lose, and bondage is suffocating me. Help. I have a plan, a box, and a strong resolve, but I cannot pull off this escape alone. I need an accomplice to close the lid, and traveling companion to keep the crate upright. I offer to pay Samuel Smith, a trusted shoemaker. He doubts I can survive the trip, but agrees to go with me. Letter. Dear Mr. McKim, we applaud your righteous abolitionist work. We humbly request your help in a daring mission to deliver a slave to freedom as freight. We would be grateful if you would agree to receive the box. Respectfully, Mr. Samuel Smith. Excuse. If I miss work without permission, that will spark suspicion. I need a few days off with permission to fool my master. The overseer examines my hurt finger but denies me leave until I pour acid on the wound to make it worse. This time, the overseer glimpses bone. He is convinced. This sore is my head's start to liberty. Manifest. Inside one box to flee another. Inside. I take a bladder of water and a drill to bore air holes and cram my 200-pound body into the box. Samuel Smith and James Smith nail my box shut. Inside, I feel the hammering. They mark the box Philadelphia, this side up, and hope I can pass as dry goods. Baggage. The Smiths send my box to Adams Express, where I am turned upside down, loaded onto a wagon, and driven to the train depot. A man tumbles me into the baggage car, and I fall on my right side. My heart races as the train chugs away. Sweat. At Potomac Creek, my box is moved to a steamer and again placed upside down. My eyes bulge, my veins swell until I break a sweat. Then two travelers knock my box over to sit on it. I wonder what's inside, one man says. 
the mail, the other replies. Ouch. In Washington, I am carted right side up from the steamboat to the train depot. This box must be full of lead, a man says, shoving me from the wagon. I land upside down and my neck cracks. I black out from the pain. Express. When I awaken, two men are debating whether there is room on board for my box. It will have to sit here till tomorrow, says one man. It came express, says another. It has to go now. I am put on the train upside down, but get shifted onto my right side. Still, my limbs cramp. Wait. 27 hours, 350 miles. Philadelphia, a voice bellows. I wait, but the friend I'd paid does not come. Hours pass and no one greets me. I pray this crate will not be my coffin. That evening, a man claims my box. Free. After a short wagon ride, I am lugged inside. Folks gather round. I keep quiet. What did the telegraph say? A man asks. Someone raps on the lid. Is it all right within? All right, I reply. They pry open the lid, and I step out a free man. I burst into song. Anti-Slavery Office, Philadelphia, March 26, 1849. Dear Gay, here is a man who has been the hero of one of the most extraordinary achievements I have ever heard of. He came to me on Saturday morning last in a box tightly hooped, marked this side up by Overland Express from the city of Richmond. Did you ever hear of anything in your life to beat that? It was a regular old store box, grooved at the joints and braced at the ends, leaving nothing but the slightest crevice to admit the air. Nothing saved him from suffocation but the free use of water and the constant fanning of himself with his hat. Though this side up on the box was not regarded, as he was twice put on with his head downwards, resting with his back against the end of the box, his feet braced against the other. The second time was on board the steamboat. This nearly killed him. He said the veins in his temples were as thick as his fingers. I had been expecting him for several days and was in mortal fear all the time lest his arrival should be only a signal for your calling the coroner. He will tell you the whole story. Don't publish this affair or allow it to be published. It would compromise the express and prevent all others from escaping in the same way. Yours truly, J.M. McKim. Fox. At the New England Anti-Slavery Convention, I sing the hymn that was on my lips when I first breathed liberty. Touring anti-slavery gatherings, I tell my story and hawk my song lyrics in the new book. For abolitionists, I am tangible proof that the enslaved crave freedom. I earn the nickname Box. Price. Even if I could find my family, I would need a thousand dollars or more to buy a woman and four children out of slavery. Saving that much could take the rest of my days if I could elude bounty hunters for that long. My family would have to flee to Canada or risk capture. A dark shadow of helplessness looms over me. Sleepless. Is my beloved Nancy still with our children, or have they been sold again, sold apart, perhaps? Whom can I ask to write letters, make inquiries? If I could raise enough money to buy my family's freedom, whom could I trust with the transaction? If I never see them again, how will I press on? Mirror. Convinced that my saga must be seen to be believed, I enlist a Boston artist to create a moving panorama a backdrop of massive paintings in the round. Henry Box Brown's Mirror of Slavery tours New England, and spectators immerse themselves in the very institution I fled. I reenact my unboxing, complete with a replica of the crate. Fugitive. In Providence, Rhode Island, I am attacked on the street, a kidnapping plot, I suspect, to return me to Richmond. Soon after, the Fugitive Slave Bill becomes law. Boston is crawling with bounty hunters. Price on my head, I sail to England with my panorama and my pain-filled ch- past. Across the Atlantic, I build a new life. England. My panorama tours Liverpool, Manchester, Lancashire, 
in Yorkshire. The money squabbles lead my partner, James Smith, to write abolitionists complaining that I have not tried to buy back my family. How would I find them, and whom could I trust to liberate them? Not a day passes that I do not long for my dear wife and children, yet my anti-slavery work is now stained. News. In England, news reaches me of Anthony Burns, an enslaved preacher who fled Richmond for Boston at age 19. In 1854, he is captured and tried under the Fugitive Slave Act. A riot leaves a U.S. Marshal dead. Back down south, Burns is jailed at the Devil's Half Acre and obtains a Bible from Lumpkin's slave wife, abolitionist by his freedom. Showman. Just as my escape transformed me into a freeman, I reinvent myself on stage. For my one-man show, I cast a new character, a well-dressed African prince. Later, I spice up my act with hypnotism. Audience laugh at volunteers under my spell. I crown myself the king of all mesmerizers. Magician. My new life brings a second chance for happiness. I remarry and we have a daughter. I take them home. In the United States, I call myself Professor H. Box Brown. I perform magic tricks but still portray the African prince and climb from the box that delivered me to freedom. After all, my escape was my finest delusion. Axiom. Freedom is fragile. Handle with care.